Hi there, uh, Editing Alexis here. There was a slight issue with my recording. I lost uh, part of the first 17 minutes of me recording because I was trying to set up my webcam and it somehow crashed my computer. Uh, so some of that is lost. You might notice it when some people respond to me, uh, but I don't respond back, but it's fixed about 17 minutes in. So enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to The Last Andy, a board game podcast coming to you from three countries in Europe. Uh, I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium. Bonjour. And Cara. Hello. And my name's Sven. And today we're going to be looking at a bunch of games. Um, the Plum Island Horror, Dwarf Romantic, Namji, uh, or Naminji. I'm sure Cara will tell me how to pronounce it correctly in a moment. <laughs> Tranquility in Dreams and Doom Mentions Pop-Up Mystery Manor. Uh, so something heavy to start with and then a bunch of lighter, more cosy-ish games. Although I'm not sure how cosy the manor is, we'll find out. But before we get to that, let's uh, just have our standee catch-up. So Alexis, how have things been with you? Thanks for being pretty great. I've been to an escape room recently. It was super fun. It was one of the biggest one in Brussels, uh, about a hundred meters squared, and we were in the um, in the streets of Tokyo. Well, sort of in in the escape room thing, and it was really really well done in terms of props and design and decor. Uh, that was super interesting. I would recommend to anyone who's visiting uh, Brussels to go to Escape Rush. Uh, that was super fun i'm also expecting the delivery of a seventh uh continent soon which i'm very excited about no um seven citadel that's the one the follow-up game from series pulp which i'll probably be talking about as soon as i uh, receive it and play it through um very excited about that one and other than that not too much but i would just like to plug in uh the most recent release of my favorite artist alan moore he just released his new album within which is a very fun experimental kind of music with a lot of uh, layers and texture it's super fun to listen i would uh, recommend anyone to look for within on spotify by alan moore m-o-r uh really really fun um how about you car um well i'm i'm okay i'm i'm currently on on sick leave because of exhaustion for a change um but yeah so um i um since i was last uh, on the podcast i played a lot of um katan actually on on a board game arena with two friends um fun game recommended um and um, this week I started playing Sleeping Gods, Distant Skies. Um, yeah. So that's that's mostly what I've been up to, um, apart from spending money on house things and car and. Um, yeah, it seems like the, the house has been uh, an issue recently. Yeah. Issue, just an expense. Well. The house has issues. Um, I, I added this small, um, like, like annex thing, like just you know, four square meters uh, for as an, an entry area, and um, my uh, stepfather was very confident that he could do the roof, and so he, with help, they did the roof, and then it leaked. So they redid the roof and it still leaked and now we called a professional roof person i'm not sure how it's called in english yeah a roofer and um, roofer, really that's the yeah yeah not 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 to be like um like I, not to rub it in it sucks when there's problems with the roof but uh, i used to work for well i used to run a solar panel installation company and uh, yeah or, like always get a roofer if somebody thinks they yeah. can do it, it's it's way more complicated than it seems, and you need your roof to last like twenty to thirty years typically. Yeah, yeah. He, he came yesterday and he looked at it and basically said, "Well, my hope was that I can use what's here already, 
but everything is wrong that could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. So wrong sucks. materials, the materials were used wrong and basically we have to remove it completely, throw away everything and he'll have to do it completely new. So that's great. That's great. Um, I don't need money. Um, yeah, but that's houses <laughs> for you. They are just an endless expense and very rarely can they actually provide income. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's my life right now. What about you, Fan? Well, uh, I've got waiting for me at the co-op, um, Sleeping God's Distant Skies, which you uh, shipped to me, uh, kindly. Um, we have to sort that out. Uh, that is... And also a mystery package, another board game, because it's 2.5 kilograms and it was D.B. Schenker who delivered it. But I can't figure out which one it is. Um, I'm getting less delivered. Uh... I'm replaying through Oathsworn now that the second edition stuff is like, uh, you know, um, fully integrated in. So I thought I'd give it a go and see what it's like updated now. Um, and I finally got back to almost finishing the free company painting, painting them. I got the exile like 30% done on my desk. Um, it's kind of nice to just be able to paint for myself again. I... I don't think I'm taking a commission ever. I might sell some like painted models in the future, but that's as close as I'm going to get to it. Uh, apart from that, um, things have been like, we've had a sudden um, bout of snow. It was like it cleared up and then at the start of this week, it just hit again. Temperatures just dropped. Um, so that's back to the usual clearing paths and, you know, making sure. But it's it's not as bad as it was. It hasn't frozen up. So that's most of it. Um, oh, uh, yeah, that's what I also want to say is um, with the Oathsworn models, um, you know how they got the push fit system and you have the armory. Um, so when painting these, several of the pins got completely gummed in and broke. So I can't push fit them. And I was like, what am I going to do? So before throwing out the armory, given that it would be useless for me for like most of the models, uh, I contacted Shadowborn Games and said, hey, is there by any chance a way I can pick up a second set of the free company models, like the second edition ones? Because I also want to see, they said they fixed the tooling on some of them and improved it. And um, lo and behold, they, they're they sending me a full set of the um, the tray for the company heroes, so all of them. Um, uh, for like 200 euro, uh, 200 krona, so 20 euros ish plus shipping, um, and tax, which is like, I, I you know, I, I was just pitching on the off chance that they would be like have some kicking around or something, but I was amazed how, uh, how, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great price, then you know, and um, it'll give me a chance to. Uh, try out the armory stuff. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna paint them yet, but I'm gonna undercoat them and then try changing the armory loadouts for them a, a bunch to see uh, how paintwork holds up because chipping is definitely an issue uh, that I need to to look into. But I, I think I'm gonna write a full review on Oathsworn, like second edition. What's it like now in 2024? A couple of years after playing it, does it still hold up, etc. Uh, spoilers it probably does um i think it's i think it still stands as one of the two best entries to uh, miniature boss battlers the other one being townsman tussle i think they're both quite accessible um especially how oathsworn is choose your thing but anyway um i'll end up reviewing oathsworn and i've already got two to go at so that's most of it um you know uh bit of painting, looking after the house, and um, w looking forward to whatever those pack the second package turns out to be. I know what the first one is, and I'm excited, and I'm not going to be able to get to play it until March, unfortunately. Uh, but the other one's like, it could be unsettled. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so let's get on to our first topic. This is the heaviest of the topics, and I apologise that I'm gonna I'm try I've, I've rehearsed this several times to try and be as brief as possible and I I it is really difficult. So this is the Plum Island Horror 
uh, published by GMT Games and designed by Herman Luftmann. Uh, or Luthman. Uh, this is the same designer as Dawn of the Zeds, which is the reason that I played it in the first place. I talked about Dawn of the Zeds, I think it was the last time I was on, wasn't it? I haven't talked about anything in between. Yeah, um, so when I heard about the Plum Island Horror, I was super interested. My local shop got a copy, we got a few copies in, so I picked one up. Uh, I've played it several times. It arrived last weekend. Um, and I was like, I actually want to talk about this. So, um, Plum Island Horror is like a thematic game. Um, Herman is like a war games designer at his, um, core. And with Dawn of the Zeds, he sort of translated this across the way from war stuff into, um, a more, well, horror based format. And the Plum Island Horror is within that genre. Uh, the best way to sort of describe it is um, you take control of a faction um, of like people uh, who from Plum Island, a the, the local science facility on the island has gone horribly wrong and a bunch of horrors, as they're called, like terribly mutated zombie like but legally distinct from zombies type things are crawling across the island, killing everything. Um, now, whereas Dawn of the Zeds is a tower defense game, I would say the Plum Island Horror is more like a MOBA, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, now, the reason is because the board is it's divided into six lanes and the horrors start at the top end and there's like four horrors per stack in each of the six lanes right at the top. And they will move down the board when they have their does. And if they get to the far end, they will do a thing called overrunning, which is really bad. If you get suffer eight points of overrun, you lose the game. So that part is kind of like, um, you know, tower defense moving forward. But the entire city for the um, player units is you can move back and forth. So it's uh, you can move from left to right across the lanes. And each of the units that players have is like entirely distinct and unique in what they're doing. So it really feels like that step forward where you've got creeps, so to speak, going down towards a base and they will cause a lot of problem at the far end if that happens. Um, the other really cool thing about this to distinguish it from Dawn of the Zeds is the victory conditions for the players is survive nine phases, which is three days. Each one's broken into morning, afternoon and night. Um, and rescue at least 26 points worth of civilians from the island. If you don't get those 26 points of civilians evacuated off the island, you lose because you were selfish. So that's where the really interesting part of the game that distinguishes it from its predecessor is this focus on moving from left to right, not just back and forth on lanes, and also having to escort civilians. Uh, right, so when you set up the board... You will have the stacks at the top, four in each. Uh, then you will populate the board with civilians. The civilians are represented by a, a disc with a number on one side, uh, typically one, two or three for the normal civilians. There are some VIPs worth more. I'm not going to go into them into too much detail. Um, and on the back, they have a little like thing that tells you who they are. So... They add a little bit more to the civilians, like there's families, so there's the Adams family, um, or the Partridge family, or there could be like, um, I think it's called Disco Dave, and it's just like one person. So not only do these names add character, they actually have mechanical relevance. Uh, for example, I had one situation where I drew a card um, uh, that said, hey, uh, if you have any... Um, any uh, any units with the same space in the same space as civilians, they get into a fight, and the civilians get killed. Uh, one of the civilians gets killed, and the unit takes the damage. But if Dave or the guy who runs the whiskey store is actually in that space, then everyone has a drunk dance off instead. Of which is this kind of fun that some of the there's a little extra character to some of these civilians, um, and you discover it while playing. 
The last thing you'll do uh, before setting up your factions is you'll like look at some bridges and see what the damage is. Basically, there's a nine bridges in the game, and they'll, some of them will start the game damaged. Damaged bridges can't be crossed by your units or civilians, and the horrors, when they run into those bridges, they will lose a, a unit from their stack uh, and repair a point on the bridge, sort of like they run into the hole in the bridge and just kind of fill it up with bodies. Um, until enough of them have died that they've filled up the space and they keep rolling forward. Uh, then you will you have your factions. Um, each one of these, as I said, has like five different units. There's the Plum Island Constabulary, so they're all police officers. The PIRL Security Services, who um, appear to be like um, from the horror from the facility, the Plum Island facility. The National Guard. Uh, the um, Greenport Township, so like people from the town, uh, the Neighbourhood Watch and the Islanders Athletic Club. Um, you will play with between two and four of these factions um, and the units will start on the board either in a fixed place or you'll have a few choices where you put them, like a couple of different um, sectors. Uh, and then you have a compound that you have to construct during the game so it stays off the board. The compound is like a fortress that once you build it, it'll stay in one place. The only difference to that is uh, the police have a paddy wagon instead, so that will drive around. Um, as for the game itself, you have a bag um, that will have a number of tokens in it. There's four player tokens and four horror tokens. The player tokens depend on the number of factions. Uh, if it's two factions, you'll have two for each. If it's three factions, there'll be one for each in a wild. And if it's four factions, you'll have four separate factions in the bag. Uh, the other tokens are the horror tokens. Three of them are what's called fate tokens. And one is the uh, doom advances token. The doom token uh, is particularly interesting um, in that it draws a event card. The, the event card uh, is generally bad and um, kind of scary and it adds a lot of variance to the way things are, are happening. The red fate chips, when you draw those, there's going to be spawning and advancing down the lanes. So the first thing you'll do is you take this red, this fate card. These cards have like four elements to them. One of them is a number for one, from one to six for randomization of certain effects. Um, there's a little bit that tells you if an event or not happens under a certain circumstance that I'll mention when I talk about player actions. And then there is a, um, a top section that tells you what lane spawns. You'll either spawn three or four units, depending on the situation in the, the game. As the island becomes more corrupted with biohazards, then more of them may spawn, but it's basically three or four. Um, if you reach by hazard level 17, you will lose the game. Um, so that's another way to lose. And then um, below that will say the lanes that advance. So it might be like spawn in lane 3, advance lane 1, or spawn in lane 4, advance lanes 2 and 5. Or it might be, hey, this is a surge. You have to draw a um, fake card to see which lane advances twice. So that's how they move, and they'll just move down. Um, the speed they move at depends on the number in the stack. Small stack of three, three or less moves three spaces. Four to six moves two, and a big old stack of seven or more, and trust me, they get past seven, moves one, because there's so many of them, they, I guess they get in each other's way. They will stop if they run into a... Um, if they run into a... Uh, you play a unit or some civilians and then they will attack in close combat this actually happens right at the start of the game where you have to do first combat so you will draw a number of fake cards until you end up with a combat occurring and if that's a civilian then that civilian unit they're the first casualties of the game if it's a player unit they'll probably survive but it could be rough that's the advancing that's all of the kind of things that the horrors do and the bad things that happen um, the next is when you draw one of your player tokens one of the faction tokens the uh, these do a few things first thing that happens is every member of your faction gets to do like a crisis movement so they all get to move using a foot movement 
Um, so that allows them all to readjust and reposition. And then, then you'll get a certain number of actions that you can spend to do various different things. The numbers of actions depend on the phase. So the game starts with like you just get one action per faction token, but then 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 the next phase in the afternoon it will go to two, and then it'll be three all the way until I think the last but one phase where it goes back down to two. And in the final phase, you've only got one action per token. So it kind of represents the town being slow to wake up and realize what's going on and then running flat out to try and deal with stuff as the factions dash around trying to save people and then getting fatigued and tired at the end. It also makes the end of the game super tense because you start running out of actions but the horrors, they, they steadily keep coming at the pace they're coming at non-stop and that is like something I appreciate compared to often in many games where you have this scramble at the end of like spend everything you can to try and close it all down and this game's like hey you better you better have some plans in advance first because you're losing resources near the end um, so your action can be moving either on foot or you can do vehicular movement some characters have a vehicle but that costs a supply supplies are needed for eating and needed for driving like gasoline um, even the canine unit can drive. Brum, brum. Uh, you can do close combat. Now, close combat happens whenever horrors move into a space with a civilian or a unit, uh, or if you choose to initiate a combat when you're in the same space as one. It raises the biohazard by a cube. You have to take a cube from this table and drop it in a bag. The bag starts with five green cubes. They're fine. They mean no contamination. But then you have to put up to 15 yellows in there as close combats happen, including the civilians, as contamination occurs. Those are bad. They add one point to the bio-contamination level. And then once you pass those, you've got a bunch of red cubes that go in there. They add two. So while you don't do a lot of bio-contamination draws during the game, typically three plus whatever events occur, it can get up to that 17 or get really close to it uh, like in a surprising manner and just one event triggering biohazard can put you in a terrible scary place because if you hit 17 on contamination that's it everyone dies game over you've lost um, the next two actions are crowd control and evacuate every character has an admin score uh, how good they are at like repairing things and dealing with people so leaders often have a fairly high admin score. Uh, there's like a camp counsellor. His name's Jason Kruger. He's great at admin as well. He's also good at escorting people around because, I mean, he knows the routes. Um, essentially, you will activate the civilian tokens in the space you're in and you can move all of them one space. They can move in whatever direction you desire as long as you have the connectors for it on the board so they can go left to right you can even send them back upwards towards the horrors and you don't have to send all in the same direction so that creates fun moments where you go well there's this big stack coming at us and i've got a couple of families here but you're just one person i'm set terribly sorry gary from the auto shop but uh, i'm going to send you up towards the big horde of horrors uh to slow them down by being food by um which is kind of fun um tactically and it fits within the b-movie sort of thing uh, as well but it makes it very difficult to manage because you need to spend actions to move these car the these civilians and they only move one space at a time so it's quite hard to move them multiple times without smart chain positioning of many units in a row to pass them down uh, evacuating uses the same mechanic of admin um, but also has a limit that you need to be in a space which isn't damaged and has a an unbroken vehicle and then you can load a certain number onto the vehicle evacuate them equal to the number for the vehicle like there's helicopters have one there's a ferry and a coast guard boat they have two um, so it takes time to load everyone up onto the evacuation vehicles but once they're on there they're off the board you don't need to worry about them bank the points that they're worth good job um then you have some characters have special actions. You can do that. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, you can repair. So, like I said before, if bridges are broken, you can't walk across them. Uh, so you'll need to uh, repair them, or you might not want to. Um, if locations are broken, you can't activate them. If vehicles are broken, you can't evacuate on them. Some characters are better at repairing than others, and you can actually make the situation worse if you draw badly from the fake cards. Um, then there's building a compound. 
every faction could do that once. You spend like one, one damage to the unit that's doing it. It represents like part of their group peeling off to set up the compound and using supplies and everything. And then you'll take that and put it on the board. Like I mentioned near the start, most of them are just like a fortress that sits in play. Um, and apart from the paddy wagon for the um, uh, police that can move around. Uh, then there is healing. If your character can do first aid, they can spend... Uh, they can he remove a hit cube from either a wounded unit in an area or with a player unit that has the heal ability. So you can actually run to a um, a healer and spend your action to get healed by them rather than them having to do it the other way, which is nice. Um, and then there's location actions. So basically you can forage if there's supplies in the space you'll get that many supplies you can decontaminate which is if it has a biohazard symbol you can use it to clean up some of the contamination in the area and reduce the contamination level which you might have to do and the last one is you can search an area um, now in all of these cases the location can't be compromised which means no horrors no damage on the location and it can't be exhausted which is essentially you can only search each or use each location once per day um, uh, yeah, and then the search thing, you'll draw a search card and it has a bunch of different things like there might be some additional civilians that you find in a new place or you discover there's some supplies somewhere or a VIP turns up. They're like special um, unique civilians that are worth more points and all have a sheet with their own backstory. Uh, like Nick Grimes, who is a sheriff who's just awoken from a coma. I'm sure that sounds familiar. Yep. Yep. There's a whole bunch of those. Um, it's a, there's so many references in this, I cannot get into them all. It's clearly a, a love story to a whole bunch of B-movies and bits of Americana. It's it's wonderful. That's also something that I, when I looked at the game uh, earlier, something that I really enjoyed is that it has a very vintage mm -hmm. art style. Yeah, like an old or movie poster kind yeah, of thing. The box is designed to look like a comic book. And yeah, it's got that kind of like aesthetic to it all. It's it knows what it is. It leans into it, and it does a great job of being that kind of silly, campy B movie type affair. Um, yeah. So the last action worth mentioning is um, follow actions, which basically because you're so limited actions, any other faction after a faction's had a turn can also do a follow action and they're allowed to do certain limited things like moving or or fighting or whatever they can't do special actions um and um when you do that you have to draw from you have to draw from the fate deck and if you get a but bit at the bottom says draw an event card you've got to draw an event card and something bad's going to happen so you've got this ability to get a bunch of extra actions but there is a chance that these actions are going to cause more chaos and more issues for you to deal with. So it's a nice bit of gambling. And because it's a fate deck, you can also card count a bit. You, know, you can be like, okay, we've had a bunch of event cards go past. So good chance there won't be one. I'll take that extra action. Um, really cool and fun. Um, last thing sort to, to note is whenever uh, the horrors get to the end of their track they will like overrun the place if there's no one to oppose them. Um, and that's really bad. Most of the spaces generate two points of overrun. The bridge to the mainland generates six points of overrun and it's like halfway up on the right hand track. Um, so it's it, track six is it doesn't have a exit at the bottom. Uh, sorry, no, a, a like, yeah, an evac point at the bottom. It in fact just has the town dump, which is like a kind of a dead end. Um, it can be overrun there, but also this bridge part way, it is really, really painful if the horrors decide, because um, th sometimes they have choices in which, like, split they move on a path. Um, they can, like, you know, a lane splits into two temporarily before re-merging, and it's a little random. They'll usually go one way, but third, uh, yeah, third of the time they'll go the other way, and the bridge is like that. There's a third chance they'll go near the bridge, and then when they're near the bridge, two-thirds of the time they go on the bridge, and if that overruns, then it's just lights out. Um, so that's kind of a rough overview of everything. Um, I just wanted to briefly highlight what I truly love, which is these factions. They've gone to the extra steps of making sure that every single character is unique and has their own thing going on. So I've played with um, four of the five factions, uh, six factions now. 
Um, there, so there's like the Islanders Athletic Club, which is headed up by a coach. Obviously, it has a lifeguard. He can like at any beach space swim to another beach space. Um, <laughs> there's a pair a, a pair of tennis doubles sisters, um, Marcia and Jan Brady. Uh, another reference. Um, whenever they get a critical hit with ranged attacks, they deal two damage instead of one. Um, which reminds me, I not even explained combat, which I will briefly do, and then. I think that's all you need to know. So combat comes in two types, close combat and range combat. You can initiate range combat even if you're in the same space as someone, or you can do it as the horrors, or you can do it one further away, so it's got a little bit of reach. Close combat always raises the biocontamination level by one cube, um, and you have these special dice that you roll. There's two blank sides. There's a side with like a um, half a heart, full heart, a shield, and an explosion. So Half a heart, this is a bit like um, Spire's End, where you need two half hearts to put together to make a full heart and deal a hit. Um, a full heart deals a hit. A explosion is a crit, that's a hit, and you get to roll an extra dice. And a shield protects you in, in close combat from taking a hit yourself, or deals a hit at ranged combat because ranged combat is nice, you don't get hurt. But not every unit's any good at ranged combat. The horrors, on the other hand, just flat deal hits. The stacks deal X number of hits divided by the terrain type you're in. So like if you're in buildings, they deal one damage for each put four or portion of four. Um, so four will deal one hit, uh, five will deal two hits, and seven will deal like two hits as well. Uh, and then there's like unique special horrors that can spawn in from event cards. They deal just like flat numbers of hits, like um, the Birds of Prey deal four hits. The uh, Infested Sasquatch deals three hits. Those guys are horrible. They're, you know, like champion um, horrors. Uh, yeah, so there's so much I could keep going into. Generally, I've the teach I've watched and looked at uh, from YouTube videos tends to go like an hour long. So this is a... It's, it's a complicated game to get your head around, but everything you're doing makes logical sense. So it's not like... Um, Oh, this is too much to to too much math or whatever. Except for the combat has a little bit of math with that dividing. It's very much like, hey, um, uh, you can do this or this or this or this or this or this. You've got so many things to do, and you can help each other and maneuver around. And um, each of the factions is unique in everything. So it's got a massive amount of options and stuff to think about and things to do. It's also an absolute treasure trove of emergent gameplay. Much like Dawn of the Zeds, you know, you can uh, hero units are like fighting desperately. It gets really scary if um, somebody loses all but one of their units because if that last unit dies and a player gets eliminated from the game, that's game over as well. So you might find a situation where other faction units start like throwing themselves in the way to protect the last um, surviving member of a given unit. Um, it is. This, I've barely even scratched the surface of all the different things you can do in this game. I fully expect to see it on a ton of people's 2024 like solo and co-op best game of the year. Um, fantastic. So, um, when, when it comes to criticisms, first one, some people have said that if you're experienced to these type of games, this one's a bit too easy. I would say it is... Easier than the higher difficulties of Dawn of the Zeds, but it's definitely harder than the lower difficulties of Dawn of the Zeds, and there's a steeper learning curve. Um, but there is an expansion coming which is going to provide more variety again, and this is a pretty varied game anyway, plus um, a higher difficulty for people who get used to it. So that's good, but it might be if you're very good at this game, then you're stuck having to buy an expansion on top of what was there um, previously and that's like buying the base game over again the second issue is less for Americans and I think Brits than us Europeans and that is it's like $65, $70 or like 120 euros or 100 euros ish yeah plus yeah. shipping plus plus shipping and everything um, uh, you know even for my local store I paid like the equivalent of over 100 euros for this and I do feel like I've got 100 euros worth of game mm. But that is. I mean, 
There is a um, pre-order campaign yeah. for the German version, like something if enough people pre-order it, it gets produced, yeah. which costs 85 Yeah, if you get in on the pre-order campaigns, um, the P500s, you can get stuff cheaper. I've decided to P500 for the um, expansion because this is... like I, I don't play a lot of GMT games, but this one, love it. Um, I, I like Space Empires 4X, I think it's really great. It really looks better than Space Empires 4X. It nails its aesthetic. So, um, do you guys have any additional questions? I know like there's a lot. Um, there's a lot to the game. Well, yeah, I, I was mostly more wondering if you say that's a strictly solo experience, or does the does it still work in solo in the cup? Because there's oh, a lot of. Mm. Solo co-op games where you play them in, in co-op and you kind of feel like you are uh, not doing too much. Like, for example, uh, Nemo's War, uh, yeah. the cooperative aspect is not that deep or that interesting. I think um, there is so much going on and each faction is so different and um, it requires so much coordination between factions that this like translates well. Um, I, I wouldn't... I, I would not play this for a long time with more than two factions uh, as a solo player. Um, so the more players you have, the more factions you get to have, the more variety in what you're doing, and the more you can kind of spread the hits around. So um, from my experience of playing it at three players, um, yeah, it, I thought it was great um, co-op uh, because there's just so much going on and you're very much encouraged of like, uh, hey... My guy over here is good at fighting, um, but there's a load of civilians. So you, my admin guy's like handling over here. So could you send this one over here to deal with this? Um, so personally, I think it's, I think it's better than Dawn of the Zeds co-op, and I really liked Dawn of the Zeds co-op because you can just you you you're benefiting constantly from working together with people. Every co-op game is going to have alpha player syndrome um, unless there's hidden information. There's no hidden information um, for all players. It's always face up what you know, what everyone can do. Nobody's got cards in hand that they're not allowed to share or anything. So that's the only issue. But I think I think this is great co-op and I think it's just going to get better because of it, the fun of all those stories going on and the fact that they've made a hard, if a faction dies, game over to ensure that you can't just abandon one player entirely. You've got to help them. You've got to help each other. All right. I have I have, I have something to add mm -hmm. um, because I was really curious if this island actually exists and it does exist. And Plum Island is the location of a high security research center for animal diseases. Oh, cool. So it's it kind of, it's you know, it has a background yeah. somewhat found <laughs> in reality <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, that makes it even more b-movie of like somebody looking yes. and going i've heard of this high security uh, you know disease animal disease facility what if things went wrong there um and i, I really cannot um i cannot undersell how pulpy b-movie this manages to feel if you're a fan of those kind of movies they were very prevalent in like the 80s or 90s and i've caught a number of them uh, but obviously, even earlier than that, like, you know, bo Invasion of the Body Snatchers and even War of the Worlds and things like that. It it just knows what it's doing. It really sells that story, um, that World War Z kind of feel as well. Um, and I like how different it is from Dawn of the Zeds, while still sharing maybe a few, just a few mechanics, not a huge amount. So, yeah, that's... It's a, it's a, it's really good. It's just heavy, and you'll need to decide if it is the kind of thing you will enjoy and get to the table a lot. Um, but I think any fans of Dawn of the Zeds already enjoy this. I think people who enjoy war games and want a something of an evacuation style game will probably really enjoy it as well. And I like that it is clearly a war game, but a with a theme that's not war. Because I'm I'm not into games with like historical or modern warfare as their themes because it's it's not my jam but make it a bit of a, a a fantasy or horror theming and it's it's great okay so we are going to move away from plum plum island and the 
animal um, disease research facility uh, and get to something a little bit more cozy now uh, and I'm going to kick this off with the board game adaptation of the video game Dwarf Romantic. So Dwarf Romantic the video game is like a one player tile hex placing game where you build a little landscape. Um, I'm not going to go into huge details about it itself, but it's great. Um, have uh, have either of you played it? Uh, I did play it for a little while. Uh, it felt like a video game adaptation of a board game. <laughs> so it just makes sense that there's a board game adapted adapting the video game. Wait, what? Now I'm confused. <laughs> Dwarf Romantic, the video game, and Dwarf Romantic, the board game. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Wait, and which the, one was first? The uh, video the, game. The, the video, the video game, game was first, okay, yeah. but it felt like it was adapted from a board game so it makes sense that they they did it in the end yeah i mean i played it um the, the video game and i thought it's it's nice i never understood those people who played it for hours on end yeah exactly okay. the same i it, <laughs> i never really understood what was supposed to be the the challenge that kept you going yeah I guess. so as somebody as two, one of two people in this household who has played it for hours and hours, um, I can tell you the challenge is uh, learning how to do perfect placements so you can generate more tiles so you can keep going for as long as absolutely possible. And of course, handling rivers and railroads that are both a bear. Um, but even I stopped because eventually the challenges become so absurd to unlock new things. Like I'm currently on what is it, build a single uh, water body of 120 tiles. And I'm like, that's that's just not my jam. I'd have to learn how to play it as the like really high scoring players play. And that's too much effort, too much time. Um, not interested. Yeah. Make it too complicated. And I'm like, I've had my fun and I'm I'm done now. The board game, on the other hand, unsurprisingly, a bit simpler um, because it can't generate an infinite number of tiles uh, or effectively infinite number. So this is a one to, f uh, one to six player cooperative game. I'm going to say right now, I don't see the point in playing this more than like maybe as a couple or perhaps as a couple with a, a you know child who's good enough to, you know, old enough to click with the game and understand. I don't think this is a, a great game for a large group of people to play, but... It, I, I could be wrong, and six people who love puzzle games might sit around together and have a wonderful time with this. Um, so, you, I, Dwarf Romantic, the board game, and I'm just going to call it Dwarf Romantic going ahead, is a campaign game with some light legacy unlock um, elements to it. So, you will start the campaign with two types of tiles and a bunch of sealed boxes and some um, quest tokens. You uh, plus a sheet for tracking your campaign progress and sheets for recording your scoring. The scoring can get a, a little complicated, but not anything too bad uh, at all. You will uh, start the game by drawing quest tiles. So you take them from the quest tile pile. They have a little speech bubble on the back. You'll flip it over, look at the relevant quest tile type and take the matching um, quest number uh, token from its pile which is also face down that will be like four five or six and then you'll put them on the board so from once the first tile is down every other tile has to connect to it by at least one edge um, and the first three tiles must all be quest tiles and at any time there is less than three quest tiles on the board you have to draw more quest tiles to put them out otherwise for the rest of the time you're drawing landscape tiles the only other restrictions are if you have railroads or rivers, you're not allowed to block the ends of them with non-railroad uh, river parts. You have to extend the rivers and you have to leave the space blank into open table if you don't have the right tiles and you'll have to come back to it later or maybe not fill it in at all. So that's kind of the main thrust of the start of the game is you're getting these quests, you're trying to complete these quests and you are extending out the railroads. The... Um, the, there's also uh, the flag system. This is something that's in the video game, which is sometimes have a little flag on them, coloured flag. And they say, hey, if you um, build a field which is yellow or a forest which is 
green or a village which is red and you completely enclose it so you ensure it's got no open edges going just to table space then you'll score one point per tile per flag that's in this um, complete feature does that make sense okay um, so that's kind of where it starts and it's it's First of all, it's really chill. This is like a nice game to put on with some moving wallpaper or some nice music and just relax and have a cosy evening of puzzling away. And it does feel like a puzzle because there's not really a fail state. You're just going to eventually reach the end of the tile bag, um, which has all of the tile landscape tiles in it, uh, minus three randomly removed, plus whatever you manage to get from the quest tiles. And that's the big like trick of the game, is understanding how to complete as many quests as possible so you can get more quest tiles to complete more quests and score as many points as you can and if you have a few games in a row and this is one of those games that's great to go oh let's go again let's go again you might hit a flow state um my partner and i had one of those on our uh, 11th game where we played every single tile from the landscape and the quest pile and we completed every single quest um and we scored like 222 points which is our best score to date we haven't unlocked everything um yet but there so once you've finished your first game you will score up everything you score like points for completed quests points for flags points for a longest railroad which is a nice tension where you're trying to complete these four five and six quest railroad quests but you also want as long a railroad as you can so there's a nice bit of like skill and slight randomness in it to try and connect sections of railroads once you've scored all the points off them together to make it continuous. Um, and then you will take all those points, you will look on a table on your campaign sheet, and it says how many X's you get to make on your campaign progression depending on um, how well you scored. The more you score, the more progression you get to make. And from there you will... Go over to this map that's on your campaign sheet. It's got a bunch of white circles and some hexagons that give you unlocks. You'll cross out the circles of your choice, like wandering up a little path. And then once you reach a hexagon, you get whatever's listed. Um, one of the first things you'll unlock is a box that gives you a bunch of achievement cards. They are on the locked side initially, and then they will tell you, do X, and then you get to unlock this. So... Future games, you can either be a you get goals for those games. You're like, okay, well, I want to do this in order to unlock whatever this is, um, and that's how the game gradually adds more complexity, more mechanics, and eventually you reach a point where you've got a fully unlocked game with all of the stuff to play with, or you could reset it and run the campaign again and try and unlock everything in a faster time. It's really good. It's really really nice and good and well done and enjoyable and very moorish so i thoroughly recommend door for romantic if you like that you know i just can't speak for playing with more than three there's just myself my partner and my dog played she mostly provided snores <laughs> it it sounds like the um the the card play uh plays pretty well which surprises me because um the, the the video game does not feel like a it would lend itself well to co-op game, but I guess having multiple brains to think about uh, placement and combos and all of that is yeah a good help. Yeah, it's it's kind of like cooperative Carcassonne in some ways, but instead of trying to score the highest score each, you're instead trying to achieve certain specific goals and features. When when you mentioned uh, the longest road, it also reminded me of a uh, ticket to ride. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Sort of um, having to think uh, forward about which tile you want to place where, so that you can have, so that you can activate which uh, specific mm. combo card or yeah. whatever. Well, uh, indeed, I I've lionized so much of the time in this episode now, though. So I think we're gonna we're gonna need to move on to Kara's cozy corner. <laughs> My cozy corner. Yeah, a speedy okay. rush to the cozy corner. <laughs> so yeah, I'm. Um talking about free games today all of which are pretty calm and cozy um, and I'll start with the biggest one Namichi um, which is Japanese and means um, basically a, a travel uh, or a, a, a journey by ship and um, it's from 2022 by Antoine Bowser 
um, same designer as Tokaido, which we've talked about before. Yeah. And it, it's kind of the same game. Um, so I'm, it, I mean, it's, it's the same um, flow. You uh, take turns moving along a route and it's always that player's turns who's the furthest behind. So it might happen that you have multiple turns in a row until you catch up to the others. And um, on each location, something happens, you get some stuff and you collect points. And in the end, when everyone reached the goal, uh, you compare who has the most points. In Tokaido, it was all about, you know, hey, we have this journey and we see things and we meet people and whoever had the greatest journey with the greatest views and whatever, this person won. In Amiji, you play fishermen or women or fisher people and um, you the first difference when you lay out the board is it's not a line it's 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 a circle so you uh, end where you start um, at the harbor and um, there are some um, similarities in locations you have also these panorama locations where you collect sets of cards which um, when you lay them together you get this great panorama of, of a whale jumping or um, something like that um, <clears throat> but there are a couple of differences so what's different first of all you have angling and uh, net casting locations where you collect fish now these um, fish come in a bag and you pull them out and they have different colors i think three or four different colors and they have the same number of different shapes um, but everything mixed together so um, <clears throat> you draw a fish and you put it into your boat and in your boat you have a grid where you can place these fish and uh, it's basically like a set collection um, where you try to fill rows in the same color or the same shape and the same with uh, with uh, um, columns um, <clears throat> so when you draw a fish and you realize i can't i don't need this you can just discard it uh, lay it on the board open and someone else can take it later on so when it's your turn and you fish you can either draw one ram out of the back or take one of the open the ones that lie around open um, <clears throat> because once you put a fish in your boat you can't remove it which is very environmentally friendly but kind of sucks for the player because oh no this fish would be way better well i can't you know throw away the old fish um <clears throat> so yeah that's um the first uh, new thing um it's kind of similar in a way to the shop location in tokaido where you um, bought souvenirs and also had a kind of set collection but with a lot more randomness and with this, you know, small spatial puzzle of where to put the fish in your grid um, that you, you know, fill up rows and columns. Um, then you have the um, crustacean trap where you collect crabs and um, other crustaceans or stones, which are also part of that. So I'm not sure how that works. Um, this is simply a push your luck uh, thing. You have another bag with all these tokens in there and you draw up to five. You can stop at any time, but once you draw two crabs, you discard everything you drew and you stop. So, um, you know, push your luck. Oh, I already drew a crab, but I really won't have to, sh to want to get more shrimp. So I'm pushing my luck and whatever. So. That's um, that. Um, other differences, there are no player powers. Um, in, in Tokaido, you had a character and every character had their own uh, specific player power, which I really liked. You don't have this in Namiji. Um, what you do have is um, 10 different boats to choose from. Uh, at least in the deluxe edition, you have 10 different pre-painted boat miniatures. It's a one of uh, two to five player game. Um, there are no player powers, so you can reasonably ask why are there 10 boats in a five player game with no player powers? 
Um, you do get this like small booklet with stories for each boat, um, but yeah, it doesn't influence the game in any way which boat you take. And um, uh, I, I need to point that out. The little miniature for the boats are gorgeous. Yes. On the well, at yes, least the, they the are really they cute. Um, but <laughs> we had the issue that it's really hard to distinguish the colors. Uh, I mean, there are player colors, five player colors, like a very lightish red, a gray, a white, a green, and a yellow. Um, yeah, it looks like several of them have the same or similar colored sails, which is where you'd expect the player colors to be. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you have all ten of you in front, and you know that for each color there are two boats, you will be able to almost surely um, assign the boats to their respective colors. But if you only have five boats on the board and try to figure out where, which player was this boat again, <laughs> because for most boats, when you look at them, you can't immediately tell which player color they are. Um, which kind of sucks. And yeah, as Fan said, why why not just paint the sails in the respective colors? Yeah, they've done it for two of the sails. And I think yes. some of them are kind of maybe a peachy color, but that's not far up from, you know, it's pretty close to the tan. Yeah. And some of the boat's bodies are different colors, but then some of them are just the same brown. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> so, oh, um, yeah, this is, this, this is um, like, in the um, Hokkaido line, isn't it? Uh, Hokkaido line? Yeah, like the same aesthetic. Is it Hokkaido? Yeah, Ho Hokkaido. No. Um, you know, the the Journey game. Tokaido. Yes, the Tokaido. Uh, Tokaido. Tokaido, yes. Tokaido, there we are, yeah. Sorry, Hok Carlos. Hokkaido is a game as well. <laughs> Tokaido is what I meant. Sorry, it's yeah. Where the I was just all of that, and all I wanted to say was the miniatures in that game are so distinct when you have them um, that yeah, it's a it's a bit of surprise. These are not like I, I can see the differences, but I can also like I I would struggle when looking at a board to figure out who's who at times. It was for us actually really hard and sometimes even even the players weren't sure immediately which boat was there so <laughs> um, it's very simple my boat is always always the one that is currently winning <laughs> or currently at the position that i need so yeah um there are ways to get something like player powers um there are um sacred rock locations where you get sacred uh, calligraphy cards which give you specific scoring conditions and at the docks um, in tokaido you had the uh, inns in between um, where everyone had to stop and wait for the others and then you bought meals and then you continued here it's uh, docks where everyone waits for the others and then you get um uh, and there you can buy amulets which give you a specific player power like hey when you draw this type of fish you can discard it and draw new if you want or something like that um but um yeah that's something that you get over the course of the game and um yeah specifically with the abilities we had the case that, you know, hey, I got this ability, which I cannot use because that's not something I went for until now. So, yay, it's useless for me. Um, <clears throat> and then you have small origami boats um, on your player boat. Basically, everyone starts with negative points and um, there are um, offering places where you can basically send origami boats to, as an offering to spirits, whatever, and um, you remove them from your player board and the more you remove, the less is the um, negative points until you don't get any minus points at the end anymore. And with the expansion um, for Namiji, there is like a whirlpool in the center of the board where you place these origami boats and get some bonuses depending on the spot you, you reached. Um, but that's really, really a very minor edition um so yeah um all in all i prefer tokaido 
I that was going to be my question. Which one? <laughs> I really, I first of all, the missing player powers led to us. Basically, everyone just took the next open space. No focus. Yeah, in Tokaido, because everyone had their own player powers and different things the character focused on, there were situations like, oh, hey, I get bonus points if I grab the, uh, you know, um, panorama. So, yeah, I'll jump over the next two spaces and grab the next panorama. So I have it. But here it was like everything gives, gives points. So there is no reason to skip a space and you don't have an incentive to focus on something specific in the start. Um, so that was, yeah, the, the first half of the game was really, uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to the next open space and something happens. And then you go to the next open space and something happens. And um, There's a little bit less agency and, and tactical. Yeah. Uh, and I, see. I also, I mean, Tokaido is this nice, you know, relaxed game and it's about a journey and um, when I played Tokaido there wasn't really much in the way of thinking about optimizing things and um, whatever. It, it was just a nice journey and in the end you saw, hey, I got so many points and oh yeah, you got some more, so you won. And here with this whole fishing thing and trying to do the set collection and... Um, yeah, first of all, it later on led to situations where you get to such a space, you draw a fish, you notice, I can't use this, so you throw it away. And that was your turn. So it that, that felt really bad, you know, Not, taking non a turn, turns, but, yeah, that doesn't yeah. feel good. And, um, yeah, and the randomness of it. In, in Tokaido, there's very little randomness. Um, <clears throat> and here with you know, the fishing, the crystal sea, and then the different abilities you can draw. Um, there's a lot of randomness going on and particularly the, the abilities, if you are lucky enough to get an ability that, oh yeah, this is exactly what I needed um, compared to someone else who draws an ability and thinks, I don't need this. <laughs> it's, yeah. So, um, I can see people liking Namiji more um, if they prefer this additional randomness and with the drawing things out of bags and whatever. I prefer Tokaido more because it's a more contained, more clear um, game that basically does the same thing. Yeah, with Tokaido, um, like if you're playing it, just engaging with it casually and having a pleasant time, um, it holds together really well. Um, if you start like really trying to break it apart and play as well as possible. Some of the characters, unfortunately, are a bit uh, too good. Like, they just effortlessly score points compared to others. However, um, you can easily just not play with those characters. Uh, it sounds to me like um, Nam Namiji's trying to do something, like, different-ish, but similar to, to Kaido, and maybe cater for more competitive players, possibly. Maybe, maybe. It's hard to say. I think yeah. I'll just stick with Tokaido. Yeah, me. I mean, I have both. I, I don't think I'll sell it so, um, soon. Oh, another problem um, <laughs> with the... I, I'm not sure how it's with the retail edition. I got the Kickstarter Deluxe Edition. And it also comes with this needlessly large player board. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I have the player mats for it. So you have this big square board in the middle and then everyone has this big board for their ship with the grid and we didn't have the room for everything so um yeah it's it's a table hawk they do love their white space don't they it looks very yes. nice um, it looks pretty yeah definitely uh, yeah i can imagine with a bunch of players like that's one thing about tokaido is the board has a lot of white space on it but it's not too big and your own personal play areas i don't think you ever get too large Yeah, so... It, um, it reminds me a little bit of uh, Parks. Parks? In the idea. Yes. Um, 
Well, the jo- uh, it's the genre of walking forward on a track or moving yeah, forward. Yeah, walking on a track. forward on a track and trying to yeah. get something like a set and beautiful things. Yeah, how far forward it. are you going? What experience are you having? Yeah, I think I think it's fair to say Parks is in the same genre. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so any questions? I think I've got a good handle on it. Um and because of my experiences with Takedo, uh, enough to be like originally I was ooh or what a bit sad I didn't manage to back this. I I think just having Takedo is all I need. Um, oh, uh, I I don't think that you mentioned uh, how long is a game, usually. Oh my! Now uh, you, you caught me off guard. I <laughs> Sorry. didn't. Um... <laughs> I, is it is it uh, thirty minutes or five hours? How do, it, uh... not just that? Does it feel like a long game? That I think is oh, yes. very important. It did feel like a long game. Okay, um, that's a shame because Takedo doesn't. Takedo feels like it's over yeah. too too soon. Um, I would guess. I mean, they say thirty to forty-five minutes. Nope. Um, I'd guess like an hour and a half. Oh yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, that that's a bit long for a game like this. Like, um, well, I, I just mentioned parks earlier. Uh, parks always feels like it's a couple of turn too too little for for what you want. You you want to play a, a couple of uh, at, at least fifteen minutes more to to be able to get all of the things that you you want to have in front of you and be able to win. Um, same for for Tokaido. The the one time that I played it, I wanted to have a couple more turn. I guess this one is uh, a bit too long then. All right. It does look beautiful, though. I really like the, the art style and the little sort of um, aesthetic that it has. All right. So when we are already talking about, um, you know, Namiji, traveling by ship and such, um, the next game is Tranquility. Um, it comes in a, a compact... Uh, cubish box and um, I kind of bought it on a whim and um, when I finally got to play it I really like it it's um, how does does it work Um, it's about a journey by boat Um, you start somewhere and you have a um, goal you want to reach and um, The game is about placing the different um, stops in between, uh, basically um, placing down the route you're taking. Um, It consists of 80 numbered cards, um, numbered from 1 to 80. Um, And then you have a couple of um, mm -hmm, um, starting cards. In German, they say just Aufbruch, basically. Um, <laughs> um, Aufbruch. Oh God, translating Aufbruch. Uh, <laughs> starting, something like that. And you have uh, end cards. So, um, <clears throat> you also have these um, basically cards that have the backside on both sides, which are used to um, build a border around the play area. So you have a grid of uh, six by six um, cards that you can play, and um, and yeah. So during the game, you are not allowed to p- talk with the other players, and um, you take the eighty numbered cards. You add the five um, end cards and one starting card per player. I think that was it. And um, shuffle them and build different uh, drawing stacks for each player. So if you have play with two players, everyone gets half of the cards. And and then you draw five cards. Now, then you take turns. On your turn, you can either play a card or you can discard two cards. And at the end, you draw up until you have five cards again. Playing a card means you place it somewhere in the six by six grid in the middle, um, but you have to, um, you know, keep the numbers in ascending order. So you can't place a lower number after a higher number. 
Um, and if you place a card adjacent to another card, um, adjacent in you know the order, like um, they, you start bottom left, go through the first uh, row, then you go to the second row again from left to right and so on. So cards above each other are not considered adjacent, but I hope you get what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, when you play a card adjacent to another card, you have to discard additional cards um, amounting to the uh, difference in numbers. So if you place the nine next to the seven, difference is two, so you have to discard two additional cards. Um, they are discarded face down, so except for yourself, no one knows what you discarded. And um, yeah, so either play a card or if you say, nothing you have in your hand is play worthy you can just discard two cards and draw two new ones again no one knows what you discarded um the goal is to fill up the grid place a starting card and place the end card the end card can only be played when the grid is full uh, or one of the end cards Hopefully you kept one of the end cards and uh, you know there are five so you might be tempted to discard someone one but if everyone discards some who knows what will happen and um, when at the start of your turn you have um, a starting card in your hand you do have to play this and then all players together have to discard eight cards. That's the only time where players are allowed to communicate with each other um, but only um, how many cards they are willing to discard. Not like, hey, I have these numbers and I could discard them. No, you may only say how many cards you are willing to discard. And yeah, so either at some point you run out of cards and the grid isn't filled yet, um, then you have lost, or... Um, if the grid is full but you don't have the... Yeah, or the grid is full and... Um, Someone discarded the last uh, end card, then you're also lost. That is quite fun. You win if you filled up the whole grid. You have your starting card, you have your end card, um, then you've won. Um, you also can play it solo, um, which is pretty easy, I'd say. I do like playing it solo on board game arena. Um, it's a matter of maybe five to ten minutes. Um, it's great to relax in the evening and um, but because once you figured out how it works and what you have to do um, it's it's very easy when you're alone um, with other players you have to be more careful you know what you discard because um, you have to make sure that you can fill all gaps in between um, and if you discard too uh, <clears throat> readily you might have some problem. Sounds uh, sounds a bit like a, a dwarf romantic, but <coughs> with, um, more of a one-off focus and yeah, you know, that same kind of puzzle, group puzzle element. Less discussion. Um, there are um, some expansion modules that you can add to increase difficulty, like. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, sea monsters that um, basically uh, block certain cards and that you have to um, discard first until you can continue playing or a rock that blocks a whole row and um, you can discard a card to move the rock so you can place cards in that row again but you block another row and stuff like that um, if you're into it I don't think the game needs it I think you don't get this game because you want some difficult, uh, complicated thing, but uh, just this calm thing where you kind of have to think for the other, for the others. Um, hey, how will they probably act? Or um, <clears throat> you know, um, I think I, I haven't played the other game, but um, uh, was it the mind? Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it maybe think yeah, it's a bit of the much... mind and Hanabi as well to a certain degree. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the mind is basically very similar in that you know everyone has their cards. You don't know what the others have, and um, you have to place cards cards in ascending order. Um, 
you don't discard cards in the mind, I believe. But um, that's right. The, the general idea is the same. Packed in this cute, yeah, cubish box. It's, it's nice to have this. So uh, I, I always like game in tiny boxes that you can bring to to other people and bring bring out with you. It's uh, it's easier to go to friends with something like this than to carrying a five kilo massive box that you need a, a lift to to have with you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, I recommend it. It's, it's, I think, something like 30 Euro, 13 euros or so. That's um, a good price. So if, yeah. It sounds like it might be for you. It's not a big investment. Just get it. Or you can, you know, try it on Board Game Arena first. Um, yeah. So, and now for the third game, which is, well, one could argue whether it's actually a game. Um, in Dreams, a solo journaling game, which comes in an even smaller box. Um, wait, I can switch webcam so my, my fellow podcasters can see it. So, In Dreams, um, <clears throat> it's a solo journaling game. Um, it comes with two types of cards. Um, you have event cards and you have the other type of card, which has some name, uh, prompt cards. So, um, prompt cards have just some uh, nice artwork. Um, on one side, they tend to have very abstract things. On the other side, um, places um, <clears throat> of different kinds, fantastic, you know, like dreamlike places and um, on one side, they have a number from one to four and a symbol and an arrow. On the other side, they have the same number, same symbol, also an arrow, and they have prompts. Um, for example, this card I have here uh, has shelter, which is the main prompt, and then four um, like variations of it, a place of protection, a place of recovery, a place of rest, and a place to hide. Um, event cards. On one side, they have three different events. On the other side, they have a theme for the event. For example, here, this event is either hopeful, reminiscent, or mysterious. And um, if you lie two event cards next to each other, um, they each have an arrow pointing to the other. So in this case, I'd have an event that says, a secret passageways revealed. Are the risk involved with exploring it worth the benefit of your journey? And the other arrow tells me this event is hopeful. <clears throat> so, now when you want to play this, you start by creating a character. I'll just do it quickly, it doesn't take long. Um, your character consists basically of one sentence um, <clears throat> that goes I am table A and am table B. And before this dream ends, I must table C, table D. For that, I draw two cards, um, and then I have a two-digit number, in this case 33, so I am building a home. And the next thing is 34, so I am building a home and am relieved. And before the stream ends, I must, again 34, remember another dreamer. So that's my character now, yeah? So um, I am... Uh, what was it? I'm building a home and I'm relieved and before the stream ends I must remember another dreamer. So now that's basically the setup and now I um, <clears throat> play one of these um, prompt cards. Um, the number tells me how many cards in total I play. So it has a four, so I play four cards in total next to each other. And then one more card without the prompt side as a location. So, and now I can go through it and in this case see, okay, first I have a heat as a prompt, passion. Uh, then I have removal of barriers, uh, a narrow escape and a yearning. And as a location, some uh, mysterious uh, cave in the woods or something. And um, 
basically that's the, the setting. And um, in my case, it doesn't happen, but um, if you happen to have two symbols or two of the same symbols next to each other, you also add an event, um, <clears throat> as I explained earlier. And now that you have your character, your uh, different prompts and the location and possibly an event, you can go ahead, grab a pen and uh, figure out what this journey is about, what's going on, uh, you know, solo journaling. Let your mind wander. I can imagine it, uh, doing it with another person as well. You know, I think that if you have the right person with you, it might actually be quite fun. Uh, you know, thinking together, hey, what could be, uh, you know, I have passion here, passion for what, and um, what was the narrow escape about, and um, yeah, so that's in dreams. I I really like the, the art style, it reminds me of a Mysterium, uh, very, like, vividly imaginary, uh, like this. Yeah, the concept as well reminds me a bit of, like, uh, a thousand year old vampire which is another sort of writing prompts journaling type thing it's very well regarded oh, that is fun and that that seems like one of those games that can be uh very fun with other people even though it's it's solo as you said i could imagine playing that with a uh... Uh, a good friend or a partner of mine and just oh you know even you know if you have a fun group of people it might just be interesting you know just lay out the cards and discuss in the group hey anyone i got an idea and yeah it's um, like a, create a story improv. together yeah it's like an improv uh, improv class or something yeah yeah um does sound very interesting uh, you've actually reminded as well microscope is another game like this where you build a whole uh, as a group build a whole like life uh, um, timeline maybe even a complete universe so oh, yeah. it's a fun genre of games that's gradually gathering more and more um, variations that is nice i like the games like this yeah um i can't say anything about you know availability it was on game found last year i think and um it was 15 dollars yeah, I, I did a quick look. I can't find it for like fifteen dollars on a, my local my local shop, so it's very accessible. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so if you're into into something like this and you know want a very dreamlike, fantastical setting um, and artwork, then I guess this is a high recommendation for me. Well, si since you uh, introduced three games, uh, which one would you recommend more out of the three? Out of these three? Yes. Oh my god, they, they are so, so they, 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 they tick different boxes. Um, like, okay, if, if I went on, a, on, a, on an island and could only take one game with me, and only one of these three, um, now first of all, if I would be alone, I guess I would take In Dreams. Um, if I had more people with me on the island, I probably would take Namiji, if I hadn't the option to take Tokaido instead. Um, yeah, so th that's kind of weird because in general I would, I think, prefer Tranquility, <laughs> but... <laughs> So, so, yeah. so there we go. Solo Desert Island in Dreams. Uh, Desert Island with a bunch of other people. Namiji, which I guess will, like uh, maybe you get fed up with the fishing you constantly have to do. But it, here in the real, the real world where you're not stranded, it's going to be uh, Tranquility. Which of the three, I think that's the one I heard you talk about was like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds most like what I would um, want out of those three. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, time for us to go to our very last uh, topic. This is Alexis with a, um, a pop-up mystery manor. Yes. So, um, do mention pop-up mystery manor is a game by Curious Correspondence. Uh, we talked about them a couple of episodes ago. They specialize into mailed-in ARG game puzzle-ish with props, um, and Doom Mansion is one of their most recent products that is just coming out of Kickstarter, but it's already in their shop. 
and it's meant to be a more accessible and more playful um, spin on their usual game. So the game is basically a cardboard, uh, cardboard pop-up escape room. Uh, when it is all folded up, the game is about the size of two uh, A4 pages on top of each other, closed up like a book. But when you open it up and you tie the two ribbon uh, on it, uh, by the magic of the, the cardboard, the game unfolds into a two stories manor with eight rooms full of details, cupboards that you can open, things that you can lock, look under, and uh, through there's like holes and, and hidden little things. Uh, the game also comes with a large uh, diary filled up with cardboard and paper props, uh, journal articles, uh, a Wuja board, plenty of tiny elements that you'll have to interact with to figure out the different puzzles. Uh, the story of the game is pretty simple. So there was a museum that found some ancient pendants that was used in occult rituals. Uh, a rich art collector contacted them trying to buy it. Uh, the museum didn't want it to sell, so suddenly, uh, for some reason, the pendant got stolen, and a few days later, the art collector is found dead, and his manor is uh, now haunted. So you put two and two together very easily. Um, the museum hires four investigators, sending them one by one to the manor. Each one uh, fails to figure out where the pendant is and how to retrieve it because of the evil spirits that's uh, haunting the manor now. And you uh, and whoever you're playing the game with uh, will be the fifth uh, people going into the store, the, the manor. Uh, and you are armed with uh, the past diaries of those four investigators. In those diaries, you have hints about what happened and how to retrieve the pendant in case of a, a little bit of um, context to, to what happened. And basically what happened is that the art collector tried to summon a demon. Uh, he succeeded to, see, to summon it, but he failed to control it. And so the demon is now haunting the manor and the demon is very fond of numerology. So it, it taunts you with a set of three numbers again and again. And so that's the, uh, their explanation for the answer to each puzzle being a three number uh, solution. So you know exactly what you're looking for when you get into the game. You're looking for three numbers. Um, well, you, you're looking for a three-digit number that you can input into a little um, solution dial, basically, where you spin the numbers together alongside with the number of the puzzle. And if everything checks out, you know that you got the solution to that one. Uh, so it makes it very easy. It means that every puzzle, you know what you're looking for, you know what you're trying to do and you can figure things out uh, somewhat somewhat easily. Uh, the game is a really a marvel of physical prop. It's super fun to play with uh, one or two more people, uh, looking around the house, reading the diary, looking through each room to figure out hints and how to progress. Um, each puzzle felt like it had just the right level of difficulty. Uh, complicated but not impossible. Usually, it makes it made sense. There were sufficient uh, hints to to what you were trying to do. You're never really looking for something outside of the the parameters of the puzzles. Uh, additionally, you get a hint book with uh, small hints that nudge you towards the solution if you're stuck. Uh, I think there's three or four hints per puzzle. So if you, it will tell you well it's in this room or it's located between those rooms. Uh, oh, you need to look for like a specific prop or, and then it gives you basically almost the solution uh, if, you, if you need the, the last hint. Um, I really adore this game. I love physical props and I love puzzles. So this falls right into my wheelhouse. It's very fun to manipulate the cardboard items to looking for patterns, to trying to unfold that little mystery. Uh, and on top of that, each copy of Doom Mansion comes with um, a folder that contains a copy of everything that will need to be broken or altered to the play. So if you want to re-gift the game afterwards, uh, it's very easy to just open that, fix everything up, and then and then give it to someone else, uh, which I, I find is really nice for... A game that I'll want to keep just because it's pretty, but that um, and that I might 
replay it in a few years once I forget the, the puzzle, but it, it is a game that you'll only really play through it once, so it's good that there's an easy way to work gift it. Uh, the one thing that got in the way of my enjoyment, and I feel I need to mention, is that the cardboard props are... Um, uh, some of them are stuck into the diary using a sort of soft glue. It's meant to be easily detachable, but as I played, uh, it always felt like it was stuck a little bit too strongly. It took me a while, actually, to understand that it was supposed to pull them off, and I torn a couple of them. Uh, the cardboard didn't, like, stayed stuck to the glue a little bit. It's nothing too bad if you're careful, but it, it is an issue, and they mentioned that if they do a second printing, they will, they will try to fix that, so uh, good to know. The game costs about uh, 80 euros. And it takes, uh, it took me 10 hours to finish it. I guess you could probably could finish it in eight or a little bit more than that. Um, for me, at least, it was an absolute gem and I uh, heartily recommend it to anyone interested. The game talks about demon and there's a couple of death, but there's nothing gory uh, about it. It's well suited for um, teen. Uh, if you if you have kids and you want them to participate, I mentioned this because uh, Alice, you asked me about the the previous game. Um, if you if you let your kids watch Scooby Doo, this is about the same level in terms of fright. The puzzles are maybe a bit complicated for for kids under fourteen, but uh, the game is the game is quite fun if you plan to play with them. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it um. It, it reminds me a little bit of there's a 2019 um, game called Mystery House Adventures in a Box, and it's yeah yeah it this sounds like a better version of that game. Yeah yeah the the quality here is uh, true to roof. I I really recommend it if people like Escape Room but um, want to get uh, want to get something that they don't need to leave their house for play them yeah a a, a, f <laughs> a cardboard escape room yes it's it's very much the plan that they, they set themselves up with it looks pretty amazing yeah <laughs> yeah 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 uh, the physical aspect of it is great um, uh, people from curious correspondence i would say that's their uh, highest asset is that they they make really nice props uh, with cardboard and, and without when, when they need to, to not do that. There's actually a couple of um, uh, physical props into the game. Um, you have a tiny flashlight. Uh, you also get um, a magnifying glass. And I think that's it on the physical aspect of it. I would have showed it to my webcam, but I had a problem, and when I uh, tried to plug it in, my computer restarted. So, no showing that to my uh, co-host today. <laughs> Keep it all as a mystery. Yeah. Um, in terms of puzzles, it, it's often manipulating uh, props onto the house itself. The house is, by the way, quite big. I would say it's about... Let me look. Um... About 40 to 50 centimeters high and about 35, 35 to 40 on the side, something like that. It is, it is quite big when it's, uh, when it's fully deployed, but if you want to bring it with you, um, you, can, you can just fold it and it's basically like a big book. Um, so yeah, you, the, the way that you, you find solution is usually by moving props onto the house itself, trying to figure out uh, how things relate and trying to figure out patterns. Uh, it's, it's quite fun. I would recommend to people to try to have a look online to what it looks like to see the, the Marvel's uh, little house that um, to mention pop-up mystery manoris. Oh, that sounds uh, really, really quite innovative. Yep. Yep. Um, and for me, more engaging than the one you talked about uh, with the uh, the mortuary. The, that wasn't yeah, that's my jam. The, yeah, no, the the first one I like the AD, but I wouldn't recommend it. Thankfully, it's not too expensive. The that first one, so it's 
if it was more expensive, I would probably have uh, I've been more critical of it. At the that price point, I say it's just it's fine. Uh, mystery the pop up mystery manor is is great, and that's a, that's a high recommendation on my end. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. So, um, with with that little uh, closing of the pop up, uh, it's time for us to wrap out this episode. So uh, we have been the last standee. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can catch us over at uh, www.patreon.com forward slash the last standee or on your preferred podcast app. We also have a Discord. Um, and until next time, we have been the last standee. So it's goodbye from Alexis. Uh, from Belgium. Au revoir. And Cara. Bye. And myself. And remember that the second E in standee is for, well, I don't know. Escape. <laughs> <laughs>